so how many ladies in here went to Texas A&M in the 60s? Huh. So there's a lot of trailblazers in here, and what we're going to do, we're going to each do a little presentation on our, our time at A&M, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. But, you know, if you want to jump in any time with one of your experiences, because it was a very unique time for us ladies uh, to, to be in Texas A&M. And so, uh, you know, welcome. We've got a great turnout today. We've got Fran Kimbrough, Margaret McMurray Griffith, and I was Linda Bloom Harbell. Uh, Margaret and I went to A&M Consolidated, and Fran went to Brian High. Well, hey, I want to consolidate what can I say? Yeah. But anyway, we've got a great program, and I'm going to turn it over to Fran. And howdy again. Howdy. So it was really neat. I remember uh, when they first let women into AM, I wasn't for it, actually. It was like, oh, it's going to ruin a &M. And then when I realized if I were going to go to a university, that's probably the only place I could go because my mother was a widow, and it was like, okay, I loved a and It wasn't that I didn't love it. I just didn't think women would be too good a fit. But that was two years before I entered. I entered in 1965, and 1963 was when they let them in. And interestingly enough, my cousin, Candy Parker, how many of you knew Candy Parker? Because those that were from Bryan would know her. Her mother was one of the test cases. Bill Moore wanted to help get women into A&M, so she applied. She was one of them, and I can't remember the other woman's name, that got women to go into A&M. She didn't really want it. She went to UT. <laughs> but anyway, at least she helped the people get in. But uh, a little bit of history about uh, my family. My great-great-grandfather, Dr. John H. Webb, was the first dean of faculties at UT Medical School in Galveston. He was on the committee. He lived in Brazos County and uh, went to Austin to help get a permit to start a and So uh, he was one of them I can thank that he did that. Uh, then I, is my family history another thing. I had a father, Wallace Kimbrough, and three maternal and four paternal uncles who graduated from A&M. And the most famous was John John Kimbrough, who was on the 1939 championship team and up to the Heisman two times. So, uh, <laughs> okay, so I entered A&M at 65, and by the way, what I was gonna say, it was the best of all times and the worst of all times, just like Lincoln <laughs> said. It was great. When I was in high school, I dated Aggies. How many of you in high school dated Aggies, those that lived here? Anybody else? I wasn't allowed. Nice, yeah. Yeah. nice girls didn't date Aggies. Uh, yeah. Oh, dude. No, my mother dated Aggies. She lived in, in Bryan, and she dated uh, so many of them, you, so many of the guys. And so uh, my family, the more you dated, the better it was because you weren't being serious with one person, weren't settling down. So, yeah, I mean, I dated the Corps Commander at A&M, Paul Dresser. You remember Paul? Uh, Lala Valdez went to Mardi Gras with him. Mom drove us there, and so, uh, yeah, I, mean, I wasn't you know, was with him by any means whatsoever. I dated a yell leader. I mean, I had a lot of fun in high school. Well, this is the odd thing. Okay, then I was accepted at and and I'll always remember this, was I went into the fountain room. How many of you remember the fountain room? Okay, it was like where they had sodas and stuff like that. Well, I've been there many times, and everything was fine. Well, all of a sudden, this guy and I go in, sit down, dead silence. And everybody was looking, it was like, oh my gosh. It was like a men's club over in England and St. Andrew's old course and I had entered the, the fraternity and it was not good. It was so funny, as a date, it was fine, but as a woman entered in a and it was not fine. And that was the first kind of blur I was, good grief, they really don't want us here, you know. <laughs> but I always had upper class and his friends, so I didn't really get some of the real brunt of things that happened, although, you know, there was some, some snubs, but when I would come in someplace, and I don't know if y'all got this, everybody go, whoop! You know, if you walk by and you're kind of like, oh God, I mean, it was very embarrassing. You had to make sure everything was, you know, just right and all that. In chemistry class, I remember being the only female. And I remember the prof, I can't remember his name. Uh, I never had a prof that was bad me. Some of my friends did. But I remember him saying this. This is like a chemistry experiment. Like Fran here, she shouldn't be too fast or too slow. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, being the only girl sitting there, I also had to be sure I didn't fall asleep because I'd get kind of bored and I thought, oh gosh, if I fall asleep and fall out of the chair, that's really going to be embarrassing. <laughs> but I really had a, a wonderful time uh, in a lot of ways. Um, also, because I've known uh, people like Mr. Stark, 
and also uh, my uncle being John Kimbrough, I think that helped a lot because a lot of football players are my friends. So um, I entered 65, graduated 69, modern languages and English minor, received masters in PR, which is business psych and journalism, and a PhD in psychology, psychology in 81. And I was lucky, mother was pushing me to do stuff. I was more reserved, believe it or not. People that know me now wouldn't dream. But Claire, do you remember when I was shy? Do you remember that? No. Oh, no. Oh, oh, I was. I believe yes, I was. Yes, I was. But anyway, I was going to translator for Spanish, uh, English to Spanish. And that's when I realized I didn't want to go to the UN. It's a little too much. Great issues. I was chair of Hyderspace. And I have some photos up here. I forgot. This is Uncle John's photo, 1939, and some of y'all remember that. And then this one is hilarious. This is feeding a porpoise. I was head of hydrospace, and we went and picked up Karen Pryor. Well, I looked up to see she's 81 now. She was 40 something, probably 41, I think, at the time. And this is feeding a porpoise. Oh, and I am a brunette back then, by the way. When I turned 50 years old, all of a sudden it just turned blonde. <laughs> Overnight miracle. But anyway, you can see Dean Harrington here and me, and a lot of my mouths are open. As the fish's mouth is open. It's real funny. I just saw something else from Parkinson's recently, and it said that they can kill you, that they can be ferocious. But Karen Pryor started the clicker training of animals. She was behavioral psychology and marine uh, science. And so she came from Hawaii with her porpoises and we met her at the airport. <laughs> um, another thing, okay, I was in the cotton pageant in 1966. I was a princess there. Um, oh, you were too? Okay. How many of you were in the cotton pageant here? Because they don't even have it anymore. I remember asking and it's no longer And also, I have a couple of people. I was the first co-ed in the engineering magazine. <laughs> co-ed corner. I wouldn't be seen dead or alive in a swimsuit now, but here. <laughs> and then I also, it has me in, if you'll see here, it's a maroon wool with white trim, and it's, I've got go-go boots on. <laughs> and how many of y'all remember going to football games in hose and ruining them every darn time? Why did we just go with runners and be done? Uh, well, this is another picture of the cotton pageant. And then... It was in Gyne Hall. Yes, yes, it was. I did yes. so when Gyne Hall got torn down, that was the end of the cotton. <laughs> no, somebody said it did go on further, but I don't remember. Maybe it was the MSC where they, I don't know. But I, I asked, does anybody know when it stopped I being? Anna said there were three at Rudder that she knew of. Okay, well, three my, at my Rudder. one was coming up, and that's when they stopped it. Pull the plug. What okay. was it? Cotton pageant was, was, it was to honor was agriculture and the growing of cotton. And of course, that's not been as in vogue as much, and so possibly that too. I don't know why it bit the dust, but there you are. It was done to our economy department back in the 50s. Probably, you know, still was a army. I don't know, but it was agriculture. And then also, now this is in the 70s. I was getting my master's, and I was in the Summer Girls of A&M. Yeah, the review. This was Liberal Arts Magazine. There were several of us, and it was in a park. Um, well, I don't know if I should tell you this, but since I said that, yeah. Okay, this guy knew him that was taking the photographs, and he knew a cousin of mine by marriage. Well, all of a sudden, after we're through, he says, would you pose new? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I said, no, I won't. <laughs> you know? And he said, oh, it's just for artistic purposes. And he told me one of the girls was going to say, well, have at it. That isn't me. Good luck selling that one. And then also, I was part of the Mamzelles. It was the, the precursor to women hostessing in Opus. They had the guys, the cadets, but it was uh, at the Civic Auditorium. They also had a style show, Neiman Marcus, and this is one of the pictures of me as a model there. And I remember, oh gosh, I can't remember her name. See you, Boo, was in that yeah. style show. She's here. See you. Are you here? here. No, oh, well, she's yeah, I know. Oh, I know. She has the, yeah. Then she on the uh, Todd University. Yeah. 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 So, 
But anyway, those are some of the positive experiences. And I did. Let me see what else it may be. Okay, that's pretty much that. Um, also, when I came, you'll, you'll find this interesting. I got a letter, if it, and if anybody else could raise their hand, I got a letter asking me if they, I wanted to be in the Army or the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> Francis Kimbrough. See, Francis, oh, they didn't realize. Oh. And I wish I had saved the darn letter, and I wish I had gone up there and see what they would have done, what I would have said, and what dorm they would have put me in. But I threw it away to my chagrin. But anyway, that was kind of a funny thing. But um, there were times that were very interesting. And uh, Mark wanted me to tell a story. I was pre-med, pre-vet at the time. That was one reason I got him, because you couldn't get a major anywhere else. And my dad had been connected with the AM system. He was deceased at the time, but that's how I got in. But there was Dean Gravett, and I was telling her, I was upset him at the time uh, that he said this, but he was really right. And when I got in, I mean, party, hardy. I don't mean drinking. I was never a drinker, was not wild, but I loved to go to different events. Every football game, every baseball game, every event, every dance, and it was great. I had a wonderful time. And I didn't study as much as I should have, so <laughs> I was in the honors program, and so I had better classes, which that was good, but I didn't make really great enough grades probably to go to med school. And so Dean Gravett, I was sitting there, and I'll pretend like I'm Dean Gravett, and he patted me on the leg and goes, honey, you're going to be married and have children before you ever become a doctor. <laughs> so, which is kind of interesting, I never married, never had kids, and I have a PhD, and I went to school longer than you would have to get a degree in med school, so I always wanted to call him and tell him, hey, but he was sweet, but just very old-fashioned and thinking women should not be medical doctors, and now, I don't know how the med school is, I know there are more women at the vet school than there are men, I don't know how it is. A lot of the, the medical schools are more women than men. That's what I thought, they're more into the health service fields now, but I thought that was kind of interesting, but uh, yeah, some were rude. I mean, they really were. Some of them, the nice thing, I mean, they'd run it up in the door for me. And if I dropped a book, they were there. But there was some some things not so good. Like I remember at the senior ring dance, it wasn't my ring dance, or what, no, it wasn't. It was a, the class ahead of me. I was with this football player. And this guy's parents had given the money for the rings, and so he was kind of glaring at me. And so we were there, the camera broke, and I stood, we stood under there for I don't know how long under his rings. I thought that was really ironic. I mean, it weren't his, but his parents gave him, and I thought, oh, geez. But um, there were some incidents. Uh, I had friends that it was not really good, some things that happened to him. One of them, who was a very naive young girl, uh, upperclassman got freshmen to go up and say very vulgar things to her. Thank God that never happened to me. Had another one that I knew that she was walking with a black guy and she was pushed off the sidewalk into the street. So there were some things, and Maggie's, I told this to Mark, but you know you helped me, Margaret. I hated that name, we hated that name. I didn't hate I that didn't. name. Well, yeah, those of us that started and finished the whole darn time, we hated it, because we said, we're Aggies, we've been here, we're not Maggie's. And you know how that word that y'all don't like is a race? That's exactly the way I felt about Maggie. That's the way they used it. Well, that's yeah. why well, you said you were a maggot. Thank you. That's what I was going to say. Maggie stood for maggot. How many of you want to be called a maggot or maggies? Even though maggies is more diminutive, it's still in good. So uh, when they heard there was a maggies organization, in fact, I met some because I said, that is like a cuss word to me. And they were just defending. I'm saying, honey, I was the one that went through this. But, you know, what, what Mari said to help me, it's, it's honoring those of us that did go and singling us out because we were Maggie's. And I thought, okay, then I think I can live with that. But what, uh, let me move on to one more thing, Martha. Uh, when I was uh, going back to a review, final review, and they were marching through my cousin, I had two of them that graduated in 76, and one of them was a core, com not core commander of the whole corps, but, uh, what am I trying to say, squ company. not squadron, but company, commander. company, thank you, commander. Anyway, so we were watching them go by, and the women's, it was the first time they had women. I guess. I don't know the first time I'd seen them marching. And you know what they called them? Waggies. Oh, yeah. Like dogs. And I remember they went, ooh. And I went, woo! And they started just clapping for them because I thought, gosh, I know what I went through. And it wasn't horrible for me, but I just thought, you know, nobody wants to be done that way or looked at like you're not supposed to be here. And there were protests and there were, but like I say, I. 
It was the best of all worlds and the worst of all worlds. I mean, you never could be not distinguished out. I mean, you, people knew you and you didn't know them. In fact, at a reunion I had, in, am I getting on time? She's saying go, go ahead. Oh, uh, okay, one more thing that was funny. I was at a class reunion, and I don't remember those guys from when I was a freshman. I think I'm a classman, for heaven's sake. I mean, when Joe and I heard one of them say, well, will you wouldn't date us, I said, yeah, who would? You wouldn't date me if my hair was shaved off. And you know, I mean, it was he asked me out, and they could do more stuff, so hey. But anyway, he comes up, and so I put out my hand and said, hi, I'm Fran Kimbrough. He said, yeah, and you wouldn't go out with me and turned and walked off. <laughs> and I thought, what happened? It was funny. He was a dentist somewhere, and it wasn't Carrie Fisher. And, uh, I had a couple of dates with Linda's hus ex-husband. Yeah. In fact, she told, what was it, that he hardly got a kiss from me, and that what, what he said. She, he said to say hello to me, and that uh, she said she was going to be here, and I was going to be speaking. So, yeah, I was not wild. I mean, I barely held hands with most of them, but just I love to have the time and I love to dance and so anyway, like I say, it was it was great. And Martha, you had a comment or question about. I remember that all the fish, their upperclassmen, you had to, they made them come up to whip the women that were on the footpaths and make them whip out, and they would do it incredibly loud, and you wanted to just shrink down and scoot around somewhere where they weren't you were looking. For a walkway that you could turn on. Don't, don't you remember? Well, that? I was always with an upperclassman. They didn't really harass me too much. Oh, it's awful. Yeah, I, well, it didn't matter to me. I just kind of thought it was funny, honestly. That As long as I had some protection there, and I usually had some protection, so I was okay. I didn't get some of the stuff, I think, that the others did. But still, when you realize you're not wanted somewhere, that doesn't make you feel real happy. Yes, sir? I just want you to know, as a freshman, a male wanted to scoot around some places, too, because upperclassmen were not That's right. Class. That's right. Oh, yeah, you got it worse than we did by far. Mine was more subtle, but y'all's was pretty overt. <laughs> So. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Howdy. 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 I'm Margaret McMurray Griffith, and I got in because my dad was assistant dean of vet medicine. But I didn't come straight out of high school. I went to Texas Tech because it was as far away as I could get <laughs> and still be in Texas. I didn't know about you, Tip, right upon there. But anyway, what I did find out is that freshmen had to be in at 8 o'clock during the week, and I said goodbye. I said I didn't have to do that in high school, and I was dead if I have to do it in college. <laughs> anyway, so I came back and enrolled in A&M the uh, spring of 65. Well, I will tell you that I've never, ever been treated the way some people treated us because I was a woman for something I couldn't change, okay? And um, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about the history of women. This is Sonia Oliphant, who was the first female admitted to vet school. And I cut off Dean Gage's head, I didn't mean to. <laughs> I asked her if that was intentional, but she Dean said no. Dean Gage uh, was holding the door open for her. And Sonia did very, very well because she could break horses. And anybody who could break a horse, a lot of admiration went their way. But this is from the 1965 A-Lab. The Burrell Act never set it up to where it would all be all male. The legislature did that. They wanted an all male military college. You could understand that back in the day, okay? But Earl Rudder was smart. And he knew that after Vietnam, we were not going to have the draft was gonna be an all-volunteer service. Well, you have an all-volunteer service, how big do you think a and and their core is gonna be? It would have dwindled down to nothing. Because guys went to a and so they could become officers and go in as an officer to serve their country. Okay, this was in 1965. After women were admitted, fully admitted, you know, just, you know, the few of us that got to go there, Co-education, the return to an all-male uh, A&M is the goal of Senator Andy Rogers' children's, of children's. Under his bill, the university would amend existing civil statutes and allow only males to attend during the regular school year. His bill to prohibit complete co-education 
passed its first hurdle in March as the Senate Committee on Military and Veterans Affairs approved the measure on a voice vote, despite strong opposition. Anyway, uh, he ended up withdrawing their bill, his bill because he said there was more important legislation yet to be considered by the legislature. And you see Earl Rudder over no. here, okay? So, yeah, but basically we were not wanted. And if guys were assembled, they would occasionally say something to us. One-on-one, -on -one, they were great. I had a lot of marvelous, marvelous friends who were Aggies. They were just terrific. And I dated some, but I was pre-med and I really, really wanted to be a doctor. And I went to see the same advisor that she did, and he told me, he said, oh, you don't want to do that. You'll just quit school and get married and have children. <laughs> and you will be taking the place of a man in medical school. So, you know, needless to say, I switched my major to psychology. <laughs> but long story short, I did quit school. I married Craig Griffith in 19, January of 1968 because he was a fifth year guy and that was the day he graduated, was the day we got married. Anyway, um, so yeah, I did graduate. I mean, I did not graduate from AM at that point. I graduated Leavenworth, uh, call it Leavenworth, Kansas. I could tell you how many different things I did. It, it, my career was like the most unbelievable career of anybody because nobody worked in the Kansas State Penitentiary for Men in the Education Department. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I did all kinds of things, and I wound up teaching human sexuality at AM. So a really long, involved story, which I will not go into in for you. But anyway, um, I loved my time at AM. We did have problems. The Earl Rudder's Bulldog Ranger was always painted Maggie's Go Home. And Maggie was a dirty word. Okay? But when I was there, I was there, you know, that spring semester, that was so close to when AM &M admitted women. I had a couple of professors that were really fond of telling very dirty jokes, some of which I didn't even get. Okay? <laughs> and uh, back in our day, ladies were ladies. We were raised to be ladies. I didn't even hear some of those words that people use as curse words until I came to AM. And, uh, you know, I think what happened is that somebody got after the professors because I think from then on, they kind of cleaned up their act and they realized we weren't necessarily going anywhere, okay? My mother actually went to A&M after World War II. And she was also a veteran. She and my father were both Marines during the uh, war. And there were five others of the women who were also veterans and they let them take classes. But they couldn't take classes with the guys and they had to take one class a semester, which they voted on, and could you know decide what they were what they were going to take. Now, one thing that I did that y'all didn't do was this summer of '65, they opened one dorm to females. Okay, Pam Adams and I, Bonnie, who, Sebastian, who just died. That's not her name. Boykin. And a couple of gals from Baylor. And they wanted us to, we were in Keithley Hall, which is one of the dorms with balconies, no phones, no TV, no anything. And they wanted to be in a, and wanted us to be in the room at 8 o'clock every night. And I said, okay, ladies, we are not going to do this. And I, I got the two gals from Baylor and made an appointment with see Mr. Benny Zinn, a wonderful man. He was a director of housing. He had no clue. He had never dealt with this before. And he just thought that was a reasonable time. And I said, well, Mr. Zinn, you know, if you'll check around the other colleges, you'll find out unless you're a freshman, it's more like 10 or 10.30. And I said, we don't even have a phone in our room or a TV or anything. Well, he did some checking. Of course, it was 10 or 10.30 and then midnight and all that. But it really didn't matter because it was a drug that was attached to other drugs that we snuck out. <laughs> <laughs> But we were the trailblazers that uh, did that. But all in all, it was a great experience, an absolutely wonderful experience. 
I wouldn't have traded it for a thing in the world. Um, I'm glad we did it. I like the name Maggie because it is a nickname for Margaret. And when I worked at a and I did a lot with students, and they nicknamed me Maggie the Aggie, so I was very proud. <laughs> very proud Maggie. Anyway, thanks a lot. remember us howdying everybody back no, we in that day. Oh yeah, you we know, did. The guys uh, did it. Yeah, well, I was with the guys, so. Well, I, I have to say, my, my freshman year, um, I went on to Southwest <laughs> Texas State with, uh, because at that time you had to have some kind of an affiliation with A&M to go, to go to school here. Um, I, I went my freshman year, the next, the next fall, they let girls in with a 30 mile radius, so girls as far as Caldwell could come and go to A&M. So anyway, my, I, I went to summer school and started uh, my sophomore year in the in spring, of, I mean in the fall of 66. Now, I had the best social life ever. And my mom, of course, we all do. nice yeah. girls lived at home. We didn't live in apartments, we lived That's at right. home. And my mom would, uh, she always seemed to answer the phone back then, but she gets so excited because I might have five or six boys calling me. Oh yeah, it was oh, so yeah. awesome. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, I was, um, just, I was registering for class at the registrar's office. And back then, y'all will remember, you waited in line for a gazillion hours oh, to get registered. And this young man came up and introduced himself as Tommy Stone. He said, um, I'm, I'm a senior oh, yell leader. Um, would you like to go to the game Saturday night? And I went, well, sure. <laughs> and uh, so we made our plans. And uh, another guy, he leaves. Another guy comes up. He said, well, hey, uh, my name is Gene Reiser. Do you have a date for the game for Saturday night? And I went, I'm sorry, I do. And he said, well, how about we go to Midnight Yell? Oh, cool, that's even greater. He did not tell me he was also a senior yell leader, which made it really awkward. Because he, he deposited me with his unit there at Kyle Field. And now so my two dates are down on the field. And it's like, oh, this is awkward. And so, but it was really kind of cool. Yeah, I have to admit. But um, one of the things um, I, I encountered for the most part, I had one professor tell me it doesn't make any difference what you make in my class. It was algebra. You're not going to pass it. Girls had no rights. You didn't go to the to the dean of your school. Um, they didn't care. Really, they, they were under that premise that we were there as, as guests and, and they really didn't advocate for us. Well, that was okay. I, I dropped it with a nap and took it over in the summer with a really cute graduate student and made a B. So that was just <laughs> fine. Um, I worked for C.K. Eston, the voice mm -hmm. of Kyle Field in Guy and Hall. I had to run a Guy and Hall. What a shame that it's been torn down. Mm -hmm. um, my, my English, my, I, I majored in English, I minored in theater arts. And how many of y'all remember Guy and Hall? Oh, yeah. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful building is that I had the complete run of it. And um, one of the reasons I don't have a really thick Texas accent anymore after all these years, Mr. Eston hated the Texas accent. He was from New York. And every time I opened my mouth, he would plow into me about the stupid way I talked. And I better change up. I want to keep working for him. And I worked for him for three years. So the only time my Texas accent really comes out is when I'm angry and then it comes out pretty good. But he had that kind of an influence, but what a thrill to be working for C.K. Eston in one of the most beautifully arch architectural design buildings on the A&M campus. Um, I went to summer school every summer, uh, took a full course every semester, three days, I mean, yeah, three, two weeks. Of Two weeks before I was supposed to graduate, I was called into the uh, Department of English and said, you're not going to graduate. Four of your uh, electives did not transfer from, mm. from San Marcos. And I said, what do you mean? I, I mean? I've taken a gazillion million hours. I had more hours than I needed, but they discovered four of my electives didn't transfer. Went to the dean, didn't make any difference. I was already planning on getting married, kind of like you did right after I graduated moving to California. It's always been a regret of mine that there was no 
we didn't have somebody to advocate for us when we when we needed it. Um, but I think I'm glad to see that that has changed now. Um, speaking of uh, President Rudder, uh, Linda Rudder was one of my best friends. In fact, I just saw her last week. We're still very close. And growing up uh, around the Rudder House was. That was just Mr. Rudder. You didn't think of him as General Rudder. You didn't think of him as President Rudder. He was just a big bear of a guy. He loved having us kids over to the house, as did Mrs. Rudder. Uh, you, you mentioned Ranger, the bulldog. He, he was all over the campus, a free-ranging dog. And when the Loftons were living at the President's house, I asked Karen Lofton, I said, so where is Ranger buried? Because I knew he was buried somewhere around the house. And she said, I don't know. So we went out, walking the President's house, looking for Ranger's grave and finally found it, you know. So anyway, I think that, um, you know, I, I really had a great time. I did find some discrimination. I think it made me a stronger person in the corporate workplace. I was able to deal with things that I might not have been able to otherwise. Um, and I was exposed to a lot of things that I may not have in a mainstream type environment. So anyway, um, now I have three daughters that have gone through a and graduated. When my late husband and I retired, we moved back home and renovated my childhood home. I can see Kyle Field from my front door, so you know the old tradition still continues. I'd love to hear from some of y'all who um, went with the a and during the 60s. If you have some cool stories you'd like to tell or share, or you feel like you can in this mixed company. <laughs> well, by the way, Ranger, for one that he would attack the Coke machines. And he would come into class. You remember that? I mean, you didn't say anything. He could sit where he wanted to, do what he wanted. It's like Miss Reveille. But yeah, Ranger was really a cool dog. This is not my era, but my mother's era. When she graduated from the University of Texas, I'd say no later than 32 and no earlier than 1930. And uh, every summer she went to summer school over here. Her uh, major was architecture, and so she went into uh, that range of math and construction, those type things. But she had other friends that were, of course, there was no opportunity to go to a and as a student getting a degree, but I guess because, uh, you know, that her no, mother went to a too. You didn't have to have a connection in the summer. Her was there at the University of Texas, and a and did not give her any, there was no hand up that she could not be in any mathematics or mm -hmm. anything that concerned <laughs> architectural. So, but she graduated from the University of Texas. What I thought was interesting, you were talking about being involved in different organizations. I don't recall ever having the opportunity to be in any kind of a student professional organization in the three years that I went to a and Now, I was, you know, liberal arts, so maybe there wasn't much going on there. Um, but I don't recall ever being invited. I don't know that there was even one for us ladies. I was in a psychology class. Well, you could be in there because Sarah Giesenslag Hintz that mm -hmm. spoke one time, she was in Great Issues too. Scona was generally a male bastion, but somehow I got in. Uh, there were several things, I think, because I had dated guys in high school, upperclassmen, and so I kind of knew some of them still at A&M. And then also my Uncle John, because they, uh, they all knew him at that point, and so I got a pass there. And uh, my mother knew a lot of people out there. Wayne Stark knew the family, and so, it was kind of, oh, you were, I was going to tell one more thing that you said about, okay, I wasn't going to graduate on time. Uh, loved him dearly, Dr. Dabbs, but do uh, y'all remember Dabbs? He was head of modern language. Okay, that was my undergraduate. Well, and I had an English minor. And anyway, all of a sudden he goes, uh, Miss Kimbrough, I've been looking over. He had been looking at my plan the whole time. Um, you're not going to, or, or else it was a registrar, you're not going to be able to graduate. You need some more class. I'm like, what? I was like, you. I mean, I'd taken way above and beyond. I took Spanish, French, and German both, and he only needed two languages. But anyway, so then he said, um, and I had AIDS, so I could have gotten out of the finals. He used to do it. I think they made some of them. Do they still do it? Let them out of finals at the end? Well, and also, I'd gotten out of German final two times, and this was before I was a senior. And I wasn't about to tell him. And he says, well, Miss Kimber, you're going to have to take the exam. Well, I was supposed to go to Padre Island with my 
family, and that wasn't going to happen. Uh, when he said at the last class, and it was Dr. Dabb's class, I did go to summer school to be able to get it, and he says, oh, you're going to take your final exam. I just burst into tears. It was just like, oh my God. And he goes, well, I'll, well, I'll check with the registrar. He goes and checks, and then he comes back and said, you don't have to take the file. And everybody, whoo! And this one guy was in the court, he says, I'm not really for women to be here at a and but you did deserve to not have to take the file all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, the tears, I guess. I mean, I didn't mean to, because I didn't cry. Oh, sure, public. sure. <laughs> no, it was, it was, well, what I wanted to do was let him have it, right. and I was too angry, and I, I couldn't do that, and so I just burst out in tears. <laughs> one of the things that I remember, uh, y'all uh, have heard of Henry Cisneros. Yeah, and you went on to, mm -hmm. you, you, anyway, he was the um, band, the band leader, leader, the guy. Anyway, I can remember he was majors. riding across campus. He was two years ahead of me in his senior boots, and um, you kind of hurry up a little to get to the door. And as soon as I got to the door, he'd slam it in my face <laughs> every time. Years later, when he was mayor of San Antonio, and I know this was petty, but I. <laughs> he was sitting. He was sitting in the plane seat in front of me in first class, and I went, Henry. My name's my name was Linda Bloom, and I was at A and M, and I bet you don't. Oh, Linda, yeah. I mean, I need to go see. We're doing like this old homecoming. Thing. I said, man, I had a smile on my face. I said, man, you really hated us ladies at A&M, didn't you? Oh, no. I said, Henry, you slammed the door in my face every chance you got. <laughs> the man was speechless. He turned back around. I was still smiling. And I'm not meaning to be rude. But, you know, I know it was petty. But 20 some odd years later, I finally got that burr out from underneath the line. <laughs> <laughs> and look what happened to him. But, that's another story. but I was the only girl. In every class I took, I was the only girl. And I can remember that was back in the days when you wore really dangly earrings. And something I learned when I was three years old, uh, we were living in Germany. My dad taught me how to wiggle my ears. <laughs> oh, you should have had dangling I know. Home, right? So I would sit in class <laughs> and get my ears <laughs> And uh, the guys around me would always crack up, and the professor would always say, What's so funny? Nobody ever, ever, you know, busted me. But that was just one of those little traits I had. Let's <laughs> see. Yes, ma'am. Did you ever get your degree? I, no, ma'am, I did not. I, 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 you know, sadly, and actually, when I moved back to College Station, my daughter works for the former Students Association. She and I thought I could just come back and take the elective, you know, however many years later. I'm now down to the rank of a mid-year sophomore mm. because the the, the curriculum has changed so much. However, I was in the hospitality industry for 30 years. I headed up convention and visitors bureaus across the state of the United States. It never once held me back. I'm very blessed. That it wasn't because, you know, it, it didn't. And I have a regret now that I'm back that I don't have my have my ring. You know, that I can't say that. But um, you know, back in that time, having a college degree, there wasn't that much of an emphasis on you needed a degree to be successful in life. So I was blessed that I was. But yeah. Well, they still, like, still what did they, they get away with that? So because they could. They could. <laughs> yeah, like they could do what they because they could. Well, and also who you knew. If you knew the right people, you could get stuff done. You just put it that way. And obviously, yeah. I did. and I didn't think about crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got my degree in Leavenworth, Kansas, at St. Mary's. But when we came back here, I said I'm going to get a master's so I can have my Aggie ring, <laughs> and I did. They let you have it. Yeah, I started in 65 and graduated from A&M in 97. <laughs> well, I, I'm telling this is pretty sad. I've had two Aggie wings. I don't wear them now because I've gained too much weight. But I, I didn't, well, what I wanted when we first came, okay, what I could get, remember the sweetheart rings? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. anybody could get them for your sweetheart, especially at TWU. Well, you have one? <laughs> okay, that's what they wanted me to have for my graduating ring, and I go, uh-uh, anybody can have those. I want the big thing. So I had this honking ring. I mean, <laughs> even now that I weigh more, what? I mean, oh yeah, I got the honker. I mean, it's a big <laughs> son of a gun. Um, and then later, I was more reasonable, and I went ahead and got, you know, another, and I've outgrown that one too. But, but I don't know, I, 
it is sad. I don't have the same feeling for the wing because of the way I was. Everything was done. That's horrible to say because I love AM, still love AM. Well, always love it. I have an Aggie room. But for some reason, the ring and the way things were, the lady was very ugh about it. I don't know. It just. So I don't even wear it now, which I'm kind of embarrassed to say because that's kind of one of the things to be an Aggie. It's kind of like being married and not wearing your wedding ring. But it was, I, I, I'd forgotten about it until we were talking about that and the ring that it was, it was, you know, you were supposed to settle for sweetheart ring, which anybody could have gotten. Never. You felt that way too? I, I never wanted a sweetheart ring. I wonder where my sweetheart ring is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. One more question. So I gather from what somebody said that when women were not allowed at A&M, they were allowed at UT. Is that right? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, heavens, yes. It's always been. Oh, yeah. It's always been. <laughs> well, what was a military school? Male military school. So even when women were allowed in, they weren't allowed in the military. Not until in the 70s. 73. 73, Jerry said. I didn't know. I knew in 76 there was a, and it took an outfit. Lawsuits. And the was even later yeah, it took lawsuits. The gal that sued the band to get in was a captain in the Air Force before they resolved that. And the Supreme Court said, why, of course you don't have to be a man to wear that uniform. <laughs> I mean, it was absurd. Well, something, I think Margaret and I were talking, and I remember thinking this too. African Americans were accepted more than women. Oh golly, yes. <laughs> as long as you were male, it didn't matter. So, and it's kind of funny. Marty and I both felt like we know how it feels to be discriminated against yeah. and to be not the By majority. something that you are essential, you know. Yeah. Well, what was interesting when I first taught school, it was the first year of integration. <laughs> so I felt like I've been through the fire and so many of those things. Were any of y'all here in uh, 71 is when Brian integrated. I don't know if any of y'all. But it was, it was something. I mean, blacks would go through the halls and then kickers would go through the halls. I mean, they tried to act like it was smooth. It was not smooth. There was a bomb threat. But the interesting thing was Colonel Parsons' son. Do y'all remember Colonel Parsons, head of the military here? I had him in class. Sweet kid. But he fixed everything up just like a bomb except the explosive. And so we had Fort Hood called in. They had a knifing. They had a gun in the thing. I mean, oh, my gosh. And I know one teacher, well, this is not about him, but anyway, I, I'm just, let me just say, I've been a trailblazer, and I'm kind of like, God, why, you know, because it was uncomfortable. One woman was threatened because she gave a grade that she, you know, and she made me drive her home, which was very near the campus there at, at Stephen F. Austin and Bryan. So it's kind of interesting. It's kind of like, wow, you know, I didn't ask for this, but it does make you stronger. What doesn't kill you? Like I said, I could be a stand-up comic. People could boo at me, and I could stand it because of going to A&M, one of the first, and being one of the first teachers in integration. It was, it was tough. I bet you never had the uh, police chief sitting in your driveway waiting to catch the peeping toms. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been in police car that, twice. <laughs> <laughs> one after a wreck and another in Boston. I pleaded with him to take me back. There was a guy loose and I couldn't get a taxi, so it yeah, was we, pretty we had a, Yes, sir. Question for you regarding your angry rig. Me? No, no. Her. Okay. You completed almost all of your coursework and then some courses were trans transferred. Yes, sir. <clears throat> My understanding currently, and I don't know what it was when you were in the university, when you reached 90 hours an hour, or I would say 90 units in California, you were eligible to get your Aggie mm -hmm. ring. You may be posted. Was, it, was the same standard applied when you were here at the school? I don't know. Yeah, I think I, it was. I think it was. That's what, I was yeah, wondering about no, that too. And yeah. you may can get it now. Yeah. Go back the and. The point I'm trying to make is, if that's the rule, <coughs> then you're eligible to get your act degree. You may not have your diploma. That's yeah. right. That's, that's right. And I'll check into that. Is that mm -hmm. I have really I good connections. I say my daughter's a vice president with the former students association. <laughs> <laughs> I would like yeah, and, I'm sure. and you know, it's just at my age, it's just a pride thing now, you know, because I earned my degree. I mean, there's no doubt, I earned it. And because of whatever those elective credits were from you know, Southwest Texas State, because I was major, majoring in speech therapy, and so you come to A&M where they don't have anything even close to that, so that's why I went to English and, and theater arts, because it was really easy, it wouldn't get in the way of my social life. So whatever that was that didn't transfer, Yes, ma'am. I want to add you a little bit of trivia. I happen to have been the first one. Uh, as a credit, go ahead. 
that and that's Marilyn Deeker. I just realized who it was. I had already, uh, Marilyn, come on up. Do I sit or stay? I was very fortunate. Uh, I had attended TCU and uh, I uh, was engaged to a uh, um, graduate student at A&M. And we were gonna get married uh, after I finished my degree at TCU in 49. However, that would have meant two years of him uh, coming on the weekend in Fort Worth to TCU to see me and his professors after one year of this said, you gotta do something about this because you can't keep leaving the lab. He was a biochemistry graduate student. So we married after my junior year and I never finished. Uh, years later, in 1963, after we were married, he got his PhD and everything. I was 33, and we moved, moved back to the city from New Orleans. And I had four children, and I was a music teacher. I, I, I became a professional musician, flutist, organist, pianist, you name it. And uh, uh, they opened the, the doors at A&M to women. And I told my husband, I really would like to go to A&M and uh, learn some science so I can understand what you're talking about. Because I <laughs> I'd only studied the arts, you know. And uh, so I, I just happened to be the first one that they accepted. And they put my, uh, they even put my picture on the front of the eagle, my five minutes of fame. <laughs> With two of my piano students. One of them, one of them was, uh, um, oh, the boy that owns RDM. Oh, uh, Hazlett, James Hazlett. Yeah. Uh -huh. His picture and Madeline Wires, Buck Wires, his daughter, mm -hmm. were on the. I was too busy teaching. They wanted. To, they, they phoned and said they wanted to come out and take my picture. And I said, Oh no, I don't want a picture. And uh, besides, I'm teaching. I, I can't. I'm too busy. They said, Well, we'll come where you. Do. Where are you teaching? <laughs> and I was teaching at. Uh, I had. A, I was teaching at the Anna Methodist Church, and I was helping Mad Madeline and James with a duet. They were going to play in a recital. We were planning. And so they snapped our picture and put it on the front, front page of the Eagle. But I want to say that my years at A&M were absolutely wonderful. I, I went into another field completely. I wanted to learn science. I got a degree in uh, botany and uh, started. Uh, wanted to, I always wanted to help my husband because uh, he was a very dedicated researcher. And I wanted to be there for him and help him because it was very hard to get technicians. He was a new professor on the staff when we came back in 1960. <laughs> And he had developed heart trouble uh, fighting in the Battle of the Bulge in the Second World War. And I wanted to help him. So uh, I got my degree. I started working in his lab. And I worked for 40 years with him. Just like the Pasteur's. That's always what I wanted to do since I was 10 years old. Marie. I wanted to be Marie Curie. So I got to live the dream. And uh, we retired together. I even, I, went, I even went back to school while I was working. And I, I got a doctorate in uh, physiology. And uh, this helped my, I just figured it was all a learning process. I love, I love to learn. And we had, a, we had a wonderful time, and my undergraduate years at A&M were just wonderful. The profs were wonderful to me. In fact, uh, uh, since I had always studied the arts, I'd never studied chemistry. So I remember that Bob, uh, Rep, uh, Professor Alexander, Bob Alexander, I don't know if you had him or not. He was so kind. I'd sit there with these big statement problems in chemistry just at a loss, and he'd come by and he'd say, okay, now, Marilyn, just relax and just think of it this way, and he helped me so much, because I was always the only girl in class, being the first one, but it was wonderful. The boys were wonderful to me. Since I was a little older, nobody tried to date me, but they were all like, they treated me like a big sister, and they would confide in me about their girlfriends and ask my uh, advice and ask me to play for their weddings, and they were just a lot of really good friends, but, uh, they were never unkind or rude or anything. I only had one prof, a chemistry prof, I would say his name, that kind of resented me, and he just kept Probably on. Probably did. Did he do it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but he just kept on with the uh, dirty words and everything would just be fine, and, you know, and I just, I just let it float, you know, so whatever. I just, in my chemistry classes, since I had to have a minor in it, I just, I wanted to, to do as well as I could, so I didn't cause any waves, but anyway, I love a and I'm a, I have maroon blood. <laughs> I, I've been, uh, I, I told my husband I would, he had so, such a hard time getting dedicated people to do the research. 
But I told him, look, I'll work with you and I'll be there. I won't go for coffee breaks. I'll be there, I'll go at night to finish experiments. And I said, I'll be there for you and then we can retire together and we did that in 1993. And uh, we moved to Alpine, Texas, which we really loved. And he only lived four years after we uh, arrived out there, but uh, we kept our house here and I'm back in the same house that I love, he couldn't get me out of it. I said, no nursing home, this is gonna be my nursing home. <laughs> right here. But that's the house I raised my family in and I have so many good memories of A&M. And I love living where I live, right in Ben Matera subdivision because I still in the morning can hear the, the Aggies yelling as they go to I, I can hear the band, I can hear the drums, and I just think I'm home. I love Aggie Thank you. And she has great songs.